And it should start recording automatically as well, just so you know. morning everyone i think we'll wait just a few more seconds and um uh, and then we'll get started Okay, I think we should uh, get started. That way our speaker um, has enough time to, to get through comfortably the, the presentation that you've prepared. So welcome everyone. Um, uh, we're excited to be hosting this uh, colloquium today. It is in fact the last colloquium of the spring semester. So we, we've made it all the way to the end of the spring, which is fantastic. <laughs> uh, and we're especially happy to welcome our speaker, uh, Professor Christoph Suter, who is um, an associate professor at uh, ETH Zurich in Switzerland. He's in the Department of Information Technology and Electrical Engineering. Uh, Professor Studer received his PhD in, uh, from ETH Zurich and then was a uh, postdoctoral researcher at ETH Zurich and Rice University. Uh, and then from 2014 to 2019, he was an assistant professor at Cornell University in the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Um, he then was an associate professor there uh, and at Cornell Tech in New York City. And then since June 2020, uh, he has been an associate professor at ETH Zurich, where he is, uh, where he is uh, uh, currently. Uh, his research uh, is at the intersection of communication theory, signal processing, machine learning, and application-specific integrated circuit design. So um, I think that's uh, a very good and broad uh, uh, scope of research that overlaps with a lot of the research that we do in, in our department here. Um, so I hope this will be of interest to, to many, many folks in the audience. Um, he is a, a recipient of, of uh, several awards, including the, the NSF Career Award, 
Uh, and he's also won best uh, paper and live demonstration awards at, at several conferences. So uh, once again, we're, we're very happy to have Professor Suter here with us today and, and we welcome you. And um, before we hand it over to you to get started with your presentation, um, I just wanna remind the audience that we have this Q&A function built into Zoom. So if you have any questions, please feel free to type your questions there. And um, we've been informed that there are some natural kind of stopping points between sections in the presentation. And so we'll make sure to address questions uh, at those points uh, along the way. So thank you very much and then and, and take it away. OK, yeah, thanks a lot uh, for the very nice introduction. Uh, good morning, everybody. So I'm going to talk about uh, how low resolution can help us to design very efficient uh, transceiver designs for future next generation communication systems. And uh, we are going to be particularly focusing on all digital solutions. And you will see this is kind of like something that is emerging right now where you do as little as possible in the analog domain as much as possible in digital. Yeah, so let me just start right away. I think most of you already know what MIMO technology is, which stands for multiple input, multiple output. And in this case, this is multi-user MIMO. So we have multiple users, in this case, two with multiple antennas. And what they do is they transmit data uh, in the same, at the same time over the same frequency band, and then the data uh, propagates over the channel and the receiver, in this case, a base station receives a superposition and then has to undo the mixture that it receives to figure out what the users have sent uh, in this case here. And the good thing about MIMO is like uh, by this, this technique, which is called spatial multiplexing. So reusing uh, frequency across space uh, increases the throughput and coverage and also comes without any expense in additional transmit power. And that's also the reason why it's used in virtually all modern communication standards. But what uh, is kind of happening right now is that conventional small scale systems, so with a few antennas on both ends of the link, they're already reaching their throughput limits. And of course, we're trying to find new techniques uh, to increase the throughput even more than what we have right now. And uh, probably also most of you have heard of a massive MIMO. So massive MIMO is kind of like pushing the same idea of MIMO to a completely different regime where the base station in this case now is supposed to have hundreds of antenna elements. And we call the number of antenna elements B. You will see that uh, I'm using B quite a bit through the presentation. So the idea is we have multiple users communicating or transmitting data at the same time to a base station that has a large antenna array with hundreds of antennas. And the, the reason why you want to have large antenna arrays with many antennas is that you can do very fine grain beam forming and you can, uh, so you can basically direct the power to the users and not anywhere else in space. Um, and this also gives an array gain and also again improved link quality between the base station and the users. And the trick here is as well that you're not communicating with just one cell phone, but maybe with tens and the number of user equipments in this case, what we call is you. And the idea is really the same as I showed for the, uh, um, multi, uh, the conventional multi-user MIMO here, we just have more users and significantly more base station intact. And the second uh, trend, so this is one trend, is increasing the number of antennas at the base station. The second trend is to start communicating at higher uh, carrier frequencies. Uh, most existing or uh, communication systems operate be below six gigahertz, but the trend is going higher into the millimeter wave regime, which starts maybe higher than 24 gigahertz. And the reason is there are larger portions of contiguous bandwidth still available for communication. So basically we go back to the before MIMO time where we wanted to increase the bandwidth. And now we do this again, we try to like basically go to uh, uh, use larger bandwidth as well, of course, together with uh, more antennas. And the reason why massive MIMO is useful in, at millimeter wave is because uh, at these high carrier frequencies, the attenuation through the air is very high. But if you do again beam forming, you can kind of like compensate for some of these attenuation losses that you have. The second important thing in this talk, just that everybody knows what I'm talking about, is about all digital base stations. And there have been many proposals in the past where people use hybrid solutions where part of the signal processing is done in analog and then the rest is done in digital. Uh, what I'm going to focus on is all digital solutions where each RF antenna has a pair of ADCs and a pair of DACs. So there's no uh, analog combining or analog beamforming. Everything is done completely digital. So the only thing that will really be digital will be the RF circuits, which will be filters and mixers and amplifiers, but we're not doing any beamforming in the analog domain. And then as, as soon as we can, we convert the received and transmit signal into the digital or from the digital domain, and then we perform our uh, basement processing. 
And the reason why this is uh, an interesting technology, these all digital base stations, is it allows you maximum flexibility for beam forming and null forming. So it's actually a little bit easier to do beam forming and null forming compared to, say, for example, analog or hybrid solutions. Uh, since most of the things are fully done in the digital domain, uh, other baseband tasks are simple as well. For example, uh, synchronization, channel estimation, beam finding, tracking, pre-coding, everything is all digital. So it's actually easier to do as well. Another advantage is you have a minimum amount of uh, analog circuitry. And it's well known that uh, designing analog circuitry is difficult. And it's also very difficult to migrate from one technology to a new technology. For example, if you want to get an improvement to uh, semiconductor technology, you would have to completely redesign your RF chain. Whereas most of the things uh, on the digital side, you can really just take your, your Verilog or HDL code and just like convert it over. So uh, it simplifies development as well. Uh, and also simplifies testing because now the biggest part of testing will be in the digital side and you have to test fewer analog components. So there are basically lots of practical advantages of these all digital base stations. Um, but there, it's not as easy as it, as it sounds like. I mean, there's a reason why people were talking about hybrid solutions. And the problems is if you go to massive MIMO, you suddenly have high dimensional data that you have to process. So you have hundreds of base station antennas means you have hundred dimensional problems that you have to solve. And if you go to millimeter wave, uh, carrier frequencies and you want to support one or multiple gigahertz of bandwidth, suddenly you have to solve billions of tasks per second, which are high dimensional. Then also, if you have these high, if all the, all the antenna have like analog to digital and digital to analog converter, you can imagine there's a huge amount of digital data that needs to go inside the chip that processes the, the, that performs the basement processing. So this is also going to be challenging. And then also the basement processing itself, because yeah, the problem are so high dimensional and have to be solved at so high throughputs is extremely difficult. And what actually is happening is that you cannot just take what you would do on a small scale a multi user MIMO uh, base station or something and then just scale it up to more antennas. This would result in excessively high power system co cost and also baseband data rates. So you actually have to be a little bit smart if you want to design these all digital base station designs for millimeter wave mass massive uh, MIMO systems. Uh, let me give you one more uh, uh, information that I think is kind of uh, important is if you look at the power consumption of a RF chain, so this is uh, in the uplink and the downlink, this is actually for a pico cell, so it's not a really big base station, but just gives you a rough overview about the distribution of the power in such a radio frequency chain. And you can see that the ADC, so the data converter and the low noise amplifier consume about half of the power of the entire RF chain. And if you look at the downlink, the downlink is where the uh, uh, base station transmits to the users. In that case, the power amplifier is already half the power. The DAX is another, I don't know, maybe 20%. So it's a significant portion, again, is amplifier and data converters in this case. And this kind of also shows you where you have to uh, spend your time in designing the base station if, you wanna, if you're interested in reducing power consumption in this case. So it's, it's clearly you want to find techniques where ADC and power or low noise amplifier uh, get simpler or can be simplified. And what I'm going to do in this presentation is I will show that Massive MIMO has this unique ability to enable reliable communication by using low precision data converters. So analog to digital and digital to analog converters. And we will show that um, you can not just uh, reduce the precision of the data converters, but you can actually also reduce the precision of then based, uh, baseband processing. So in the digital domain, when you process the data, you can also operate with significantly lower precision to even further reduce power or uh, and increase the bandwidth in this case. So more or less everything we're going to talk about is about ADCs and DACs in this presentation. OK, so why is uh, low resolution important? Uh, if we reduce the resolution of the ADCs and DACs, uh, then uh, because we have so many ADCs and DACs, we, of course, if you reduce the resolution, uh, we can reduce the power consumption because the power depends roughly exponentially on the number of bits that each data converter has. So if you can reduce the number of bits, you can significantly reduce the power consumption. Uh, then also, if you, if you lower the resolution of the data converters, then the rest of your RF chain, like amplifiers, filters, mixers, don't need to be as good uh, because uh, they just need to be operating uh, slightly higher than the quantization noise floor. You have to be a little bit careful with this, but just think about it. If you make the data converters bad, you can also kind of like make your RF bad as well. Not too much, but you can do that a little bit. And then, of, of course, like another consequence is if your resolution of the input of the, of the digital domain is also lower, of course, you can probably also process the data at lower resolution. But these are the things that we're going to discuss in this presentation. 
And then there's one other very important aspect, and that's that um, if you can lower the, the precision of the data converters, you can also lower the data rates from and to the converter. So if you have antennas and uh, ADCs and you have to transport the digital information into some basement processing hardware, uh, this can also significantly reduce that bottleneck as well. And here's just one number. If you think about a base station with 256 antennas and you use 10-bit ADCs, which is on the lower end for existing base stations, and you sample at only 200 mega samples per second, then you already have one terabit of data, just raw data that will go from the data converters into your processing engine. So you can see that if you can somehow reduce precision, say if you can have the precision, you can already have uh, the data rates in this case. And that, that's not just a problem for the interconnect, it's also power consumption. Like these interconnects also uh, consume a huge amount of power. And if you build, for example, an integrated circuit, getting in uh, one terabit of data into an integrated circuit is not a trivial task as well. So this will basically address all these issues if you can reduce the resolution. And what I'm going to uh, more specifically talk in this presentation is first we're going to show, uh, talk about the uplink. Uh, uplink uh, is when the users communicate to the base station. We're also going to show how, what you can do in the downlink. So if you reduce the resolution uh, in the situation where the base station is transmitting to the users, and then I'm also going to show how we can reduce the precision in basement processing itself uh, if you operate with massive MIMO. So this is kind of the three parts. And after each part, I will, I will be able to answer questions. But if there's a question right now, I can do that now, but I don't see any in question and answers. Uh, so I will just continue in that case, I guess. OK, so let's look at the first part, uh, the uplink where the user equipment, so your cell phones are communicating with um, the base station. And I'm going to look at a, a simple architecture. Uh, we can make it more complicated later, but basically the architecture is, is, is kind of simple. We have a transmitter, which is as a data source, uh, maps the data, modulates it over the channel. Uh, we have U of them, so we have U users. They communicate over a frequency flat channel. Um, and then we receive the data as multiple antennas. We amplify, we mix it down, and we have our ADCs, and then everything else is in digital. So this is an all digital architecture where each antenna of the B antennas basically has minimum amount of RF and then uh, performs a digital processing. And if you think about if you have a one bit ADC for the in-phase uh, part and the one bit ADC for the quadrature part here, basically you, you were able to resolve four distinct points. And you can imagine that if you have three bit ADCs, uh, then each ADC is able to resolve eight points of these. So you get in this case, 64 points that you can resolve. So this is kind of the resolution that you get here at the input of the digital domain. And the model, just to be a little bit more uh, clear, is a very simple one, just to make, just to kind of like make the key points. But what we have is we have a received vector. That's the vector that we uh, that is here at the outputs of the ADCs. Then Q is the uh, describes the function of the individual ADCs, and Q kind of operates independently on the real and the imaginary part of what you receive. Then H is the MIMO channel matrix. Um, so it's it's B by U basically because we have B receivers and uh, U users. And then we, of course, have thermal noise, which is the thermal noise here at the antennas in this case. So it's a very simple model, uh, but I will quickly mention at the end that this can be made very general for like an OFDM system uh, with all sorts of things. But this just to make the point that we'll look at the very simple model in this case. Okay, so the, the one of the key questions, is how can you deal with quantization errors? And there are multiple ways, like how do we analyze a system that has this nonlinear operation, which is a quantizer that takes a continuous uh, value and maps it to a discrete set? And one of the simplest model is you assume some statistics on your input signal here of the ADC. And then you say it goes to this nonlinear function and the output is just basically what goes in plus some quantization noise. Uh, for this very simple uh, additive quantization noise model, the quantization error will be statistically dependent with the input in this case. And if you want to do an exact analysis, it's actually kind of difficult. Um, a more sophisticated model, or if probably the most sophisticated model, is you model this transfer function here uh, between uh, the input and the output as a probability distribution. Uh, this is exact. Uh, there is nothing, no approximation going on. But it turns out that like de developing uh, the theory for an exact model like that is actually kind of difficult. But there is a solution, and it's uh, well known. And I also know that uh, Professor Heath is also using it. Uh, which is known as Buskong's theorem. And basically the trick is very similar to the additive uh, quantization noise. What you do is you allow some factor G that is multiplied to the input. So you say that the input, when going through the quantize, it can be modeled as your input signal attenuated by some gain. So this is a number that is typically smaller than one. 
plus some quantization error. And if you pick that value G appropriately, then you can make the quantization uh, error here uh, uncorrelated with the uh, input. And before, remember before it was statistically dependent, here it's uncorrelated. Uncorrelated, of course, is not independent, but you could think of it as being like a first order independence. And that actually this, this uncorrelatedness helps to simplify theoretical analysis using this model. Yeah, this is known as Buskong's uh, theorem. And it's kind of well known for the people who know already. Uh, it turns out that people have been using this, especially RF circuit designers have been using this result for ages. But just like maybe over the last, I would say, five years found its application into the communication theory community. So this is a, a tool that is out there for a long time, uh, since 1952, but has been used by RF engineers for decades. But just recently, people start using it to do communication theory. Yeah, so we will, we're also going to use this, this uh, model quite a bit. So if you look again at the model, if you think about the, the model we had at the beginning, we have a massive MIMO model. What we can do now is we can start linearizing this input output relation of the channel where we have our quantizer. And we can now just replace this quantizer with this idea of boost gang, where uh, G turns out to be a diagonal matrix. And the value of this diag the, the, the diagonal elements of this matrix uh, they depend on the ADC type and also the, the magnitude. So they depend kind of like on the statistics of what's going in. But just think about is you can decompose this nonlinear system into something that is linear like this, plus some uh, noise term that will be uncorrelated that everything that is in here, uh, HS plus N. And if you have a simple linearized expression, you can do multiple things with it. The simplest one is you just derive a channel estimator. So this is, I'm not going into too much details, but basically linearizing helps you to now use the simplest uh, linear channel estimators to get an expression of an estimate of the channel, where you can see that the expression depends on this boost gain that depends on the ABC, so you see G here, depends on the SNR, and of course also depends on the number of pilots. But here it's not about like how, how the exact form is, but just to show you that you can get very simple expressions for like a very simple, um, Channel estimators in this case. Even though there was a nonlinearity here, which is the quantizer, you can get very simple uh, expressions for, for example, a channel estimator. Uh, and then what you can do is you can apply the zero forcing, you can invert the matrix, you can multiply it to your received vector here, and then you can analyze the performance. So this is, will be like the simplest possible receiver that you can think of. And now the question, of course, is why we did a lot. We did the linearization of something that is highly nonlinear. We use a very simple channel estimator. We use just a very simple uh, receiver. The question is how well does that even work? And it turns out that such a very simple analysis is extremely accurate. So this one here shows um, signal to noise ratio versus uncoded bit error rate. Uh, this is for QPSK transmission. We use a very simple Rayleigh fading channel, 210 out of 10 users, 10 pilots. And what is interesting here is that we show two things. We show a solid line and we show markers. The solid line is the analysis that I was just showing, and the markers is what you actually would simulate if you do Monte Carlo simulation. So you can see it's very, very close for a one bit ADC in this case. And if you go to two bits, again, it's extremely close. If you go to three bits, it's extremely close. You can see that the analysis matches extremely well uh, what you would simulate. So you don't have to simulate in this case. But what it also shows here, so the, the black curve here is for infinite resolution. So think about it in absence of any analog to digital converters. And you can see that with three bits, you're already very, very close um, to uh, infinite resolution. So this also shows you you don't need 10 bits. You're probably fine with bits around three, four, five, something like that, because you can get very close uh, to an infinite resolution receiver. Yeah. And just for the, for the to uh, kind of like save time, uh, all the results I was showing can be done for uh, OFDM systems as well. But um, I'm not going to show this. I have, I have backup slides if someone wants to ask at the end. Uh, all Everything I was showing before also works for OFDM, but I'm not going to show the results uh, for the lack of time, but everything carries over because you can in OFDM, you can basically rewrite the input output relation in exactly the same way in a, and linearize and then deal with it. And it's, it's not that big of a deal. And I think I just saw that somebody had the question. Maybe we can ask, I can answer that question right now. I can't see what the question is. I don't know where I can see that. If somebody can help me. Oh, sure. Yes. Um, oh, absolutely. Like, oh, oh go ahead, Michael. Go ahead. Sure. Um, so the question was from Greg Bottomley. So early all digital based station receivers used low precision ADs, and precision was recovered when extracting a narrow band channel. 
filtering, combining in time. It seems here you are recovering precision by combining spatially with a large number of antennas. I assume he's asking, is that is that correct? And yeah, that, that's there? exactly. So the idea is really you basically you you distribute your ADC over or your resolution over multiple antennas. And so it's not it's not just how should I say it's not just um, yeah it's, it's not it's not the same that you do like temporal oversampling or something, but you do spatial oversampling is what I would say. So yeah, each you have more antennas now, and you want each of them, each of these antennas, the sampler or the ABC does not need to be as accurate. So I think it's exactly that, exactly that idea. Yeah. Sounds good. Another question. We can just deal with that now. Yeah. Yeah, that was it. Greg just said thanks. Oh, okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah, I'm not I'm gonna skip the whole OFDM story. If somebody wants to know, I can have some backup slides, but I remove them, otherwise I will not make it through. Um, yeah, so now let's look at the opposite case where the base station is communicating with the users and you will see it's similar, but it has some subtle differences that make it actually kind of interesting. So we look at the, again, at a very simple uh, system model where we have, um, we have a data source for each user. So each data source here is the data that we want to send to each of these individual users. We have something that is known as a precoder and the precoder's goal is basically to prepare the signals that you send that after they go through the channel that each user only sees their own signal. So think about it, the channel creates a mixture of the signal that you're sending. You kind of pre-invert the effect of the channel that when everything you're sending here goes to the channel, each user really only gets what they should get. So that's what the precoder is doing. And then we have a bunch of uh, DACs and then we mix it up uh, power amplifier and sending it. So that's basically the model. The system model is slightly different, but very similar. So in this case, what we have is the vector Y is the received signal at each antenna here. So each entry of the vector is one user's received signal. Then H is the downlink channel in this case. So it's the models the propagation path between the base station and the users. And then this vector X is what's coming out of the DAX. It's not what's going into the precode, it's what's coming out of the DAX that has the same dimension as the number of base station antennas, but is, is going to be discrete. It's going to be taken from each entry of that vector X is going to be taken from a discrete set X in this case. And the discrete set uh, is defined by how many quantization levels we can create. And then what we have, we have S, which is the vector that is actually containing the data source. The vector S is the data we want the users to receive. And this vector S, together with knowledge of the channel, will be mapped to the output of the DAX here. So this X, think about what's coming out of the DAX, is a function of what we want to send to the users and also knowledge of the channel. And of course, then we have also noise at the receive side. So this will be the noise here at the at uh, each user in this case. And it actually turns out to be kind of an interesting problem here. So it, it's, it looks very similar, but it, it, is, it is different. And what we try to do is we try to find what possible vector X, so think about it, the vector X is the data that's coming out of these DAX. Uh, we have to find a vector X so that when our signal is going through the channel is as close as possible to what the user is supposed to be seeing. So what we want is we want that the users uh, are receiving an estimate. So what we want is the user receive a vector y. The users would scale up however they want what they receive, but then this is their estimate. And basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to design a vector x after passing through the channel and uh, amplified or attenuated by the user is as close as possible to what they're supposed to be seeing. So the symbol, the vector s is the data that we want to send. And basically what this does, it minimizes the received side mean squared error between the estimates that the user create and what we want to send. And what we want to send depends on the channel and also what's coming out of the DAX and also this uh, factor that the user can mess around with. And there's also some additional term which comes from the fact that we want to minimize the MSE in this case. So it just shows that like the problem is a little bit different if you, if you have to create that vector X as, so, so that the result, what's coming out of the channel at the user side is as close as possible to what the users are supposed to be seeing. And this already shows us how do we do this pre-coding problem? So how do we solve it? Basically, we want to solve, we want to minimize this mean squared error. So we want to minimize this expression, but we want to do it at the same time. Uh, we, we want to find what is the optimal uh, signal that comes out of the DAC. So what is the optimal discrete uh, entry vector that comes out of the DAC? so that this is uh, minimized here. And then we also allow this beta factor to be chosen by the users as, as, as they want. And on top of that, we have to make sure that we're not violating a power constraint. So what we are sending out of our, uh, of our antenna array, what's coming out of our DAX needs to be limited in terms of the 
uh, power in, and that's what, what this term is. So this is an optimization problem in, in a vector X in a scalar beta, and we also have this constraint that makes sure that what we're sending it doesn't violate the power constraint. Uh, this is a, actually a very nasty problem. It turns out to be NP-hard. Uh, and the reason is because the vector x is discrete. It's taken from a discrete set. And if you uh, look at if you would like to solve this using an exhaustive search, which would be kind of like a brute force approach uh, for a 256 uh, antenna systems with one big DAX, you would have to evaluate the objective function 10 to 154 times. And clearly, you cannot do that. So this implies that you need approximate methods uh, to solve this problem. There's no way you can ever solve this problem, at least with what we know as of now. Christoph, we have one question, I think, related to this. OK, um, cool. Yeah, yeah we can, we, I can do that now. Yeah. From Aranya, why not minimize the one norm instead of two norm MSE? Wouldn't that further reduce resolution? Um, so this one here, basically think about is this. This is the error at the receive side. And it's pretty natural of minimizing the L2 error at the receive side. Um, the L1 error would be a little bit, uh, would basically, how should I say, the L1 error would be for a different noise statistics. What I have seen, maybe I can, I can give you an indirect answer. What I have seen is people not using the two norm, but people using minimizing the infinity norm. The infinity norm would be the worst error. So you look at each, at, at each user at the individual errors, and you only uh, minimize the worst of these errors. So that makes sense, because with that, you're kind of making, you're improving the worst case. With the L2 norm, you're kind of like minimizing everything on average. With the L1 norm, you will be very trying to minimize all of them like very strongly. I mean, it, it, I'm not sure whether it will reduce resolution. Um, I have never tried the L1 norm. It will be interesting to try. But one thing I can guarantee you is that solving the L1 norm problem is even more complicated than this problem here. Uh, yeah, because you will see we will actually make use of the fact that there's a two norm later that we can solve it. But this is a good question. I, I cannot give you an answer whether it's going to be more efficient, but I've seen people using the infinity norm uh, as well as an alternative. Yeah. Thank you. OK, so yeah, let's, let's keep on going. So the simplest approach is, because we need simpler algorithms, is basically just to say, let's ignore the presence of a quantizer or a DAC in this case. Let's just do conventional precoding and then quantize the output of the precoder. And we call this linear quantized precoding because we first do a linear precoder and then we just quantize the output. And the good thing is about this is we can analyze the performance using, again, via Busgang's decomposition. So that's a good thing. And let's do this quickly, but I'm going over this very quickly. So we can look at the bit, uh, the signal to noise ratio. This is now the downlink signal to noise ratio versus the bit error rate at the users. And again, we see here that if you have one bit DAX, uh, um, that uh, the performance of the simulated results and the analytical results are very close. And also you can see again that if you have about three bit DAX in this case, you're very close to infinite resolution, where infinite resolution again would be just like a system, there will be no uh, DAX, there will be like infinite resolution transmitter. And this one is for, again, Rayleigh fading 128 users, uh, 128 base station antenna 16 users. So just this shows again, there's a theoretical analysis and you don't need that many bits uh, to operate. But uh, I think one of the key questions is these linear quantized precoders, especially if you run them, say, for one or only two bits, how close to optimal are they? Uh, this is a very simple algorithm, but how close would they be to solving, say, uh, this complicated optimization problem? And we can actually do that, but we can do it for a trivial system where we have eight base station antennas, two users. Uh, and in that case, we can do an exhaustive search. So this one here is a... Um, this one here would be the receive constellation at infinite SNR uh, for 10 bit DAX. And this would be this quantized linear quantized precoder, what you would receive if you had one bit DAX. And you can see basically the 16 QIM constellation is completely messed up. There's almost no way, unless you use very strong codes, to, um, to uh, get this to a reliable communication. But if you solve that linear quantized problem, that NP hard problem that I was showing, and this is actually solved with uh, an exhaustive search, you can see you get. get very nice uh, constellations back and you can actually do reliable communication. So you can see here clearly um, this like linear quantized approach is far from what's possible in this case here. And of course, if you see this, then you ask yourself, so are there any ways that we can come up with approximate methods to get close to the optimal one, but not having the uh, exponential complexity in the number of base station antennas? And the interesting thing is, yes, we can do it. And again, uh, one reason is because of the two norm here, but there's some other tricks that we, we can do. And I'm going to just show you a bunch of tricks that are kind of interesting 
uh, also from like an optimization perspective is how do we even attack a problem like this? And what we're basically looking at here is something we call nonlinear pre-coding. So we have our signal, our symbol is going in, and then there's some black box. It's basically an algorithm that solves a problem or an approximate version of this problem, and then outputs our quantized vector. And there are two tricks that you can use, or there's many more, I think recently, like in the last maybe one or two years, but uh, I will show only one of them. One is semi-definite relaxation. So you can kind of like drop a term and then use something, uh, it's kind of a convexification of a discrete uh, signal. So if you have a signal that is plus minus one, you can use a technique known as semi-definite relaxation and then you can solve it approximately. And typically you get the performance very close to say the original problem. Uh, and another approach is an algorithm that we developed, uh, which we call biconvex one bit precoding with the terrible name of C1PO. Uh, this is a, a way where we are kind of convexifying this problem in some way and then solving it in an iterative way. And I'm not going to too many algorithm details, uh, if, uh, at least not now, but basically I just wanna show you how much better you can do compared to linear quantized precoders. So this one here is one bit DAX. So this is the hardest case. The black curve is infinite resolution uh, and the blue curve is what you've seen before where you first do linear precoding, uh, zero person precoding, and then you quantize. And you can see that semi-definite relaxation and C1PO achieve a performance that is about two or three dB away from infinite precision. And you can see, especially if you go to slightly higher SNRs, uh, the performance gap is actually significant to these methods here. So yeah, there you can you can do significantly better by uh, using some approximate version of a nonlinear precoder. Uh, so this is kind of like the, the key message that if you spend a little bit of time finding a better algorithm, you can actually do much better than some simple method in this case. And let me um, first show you some results. So it turns out that the C1PO uh, algorithm can actually be implemented in hardware. So this is a chip that we developed. Uh, I think this is uh, in 2017. It has some other designs on it as well. The thing that is highlighted with white here is a, a one-bit precoder. It's the C1PO. There's some other blocks on it as well. And basically the point um, I wanna make with this is uh, we tried first to see, can we implement semi-definite relaxation, but it's nearly impossible uh, to do that efficiently. So we developed the C1PO algorithm uh, from the beginning on by knowing that eventually we, we want to implement it. So we had to think when designing this algorithm uh, about some certain hardware aspects to make it efficient. Uh, and you can also see here, you can actually get, it's a very small design in 28 nanometer, uh, the design is, is only 0.41 square millimeters, but you can already process 19 million uh, pre-coding problems per second, which is actually very high for a very small design in this case. And this is for 32 antennas, but you can also do it for bigger ones. If you, I think if I remember correctly, if you double uh, the antenna, number of antennas, the area will basically double roughly, uh, slightly more than double, but almost double. But the point I wanted to make here is that these nonlinear pre-coders, they can actually be implemented in in hardware, and this is this is the proof that this is possible. Um, and I'm not going to show uh, a lot about the algorithm, how the C1PO algorithm works, because I'm going to show you later how we solve a related problem. And then uh, if somebody wants to know, I can I can uh, give a little bit more detail how this works. But you will see we kind of use a similar trick later in the presentation. So I'm not going to show it right now. OK, so now will be the time for questions, or I will uh, continue with the third part, which I think is the personally the most exciting one because it's also the most recent one. Okay, there's no, no question right now. So the idea now you've seen, we can reduce the resolution of the ADCs. We can reduce the resolutions of the DAX. We don't need that high resolution. And now of course it's very natural to ask, can we also reduce the resolution of baseband processing itself? So all the processing chain that is done in digital. And again, uh, to make the point, it's kind of like that this is possible is we look again at a very simple system. We look at an all digital uh, base station in this case here, where we have, again, the users, we have our RF chains and we have channel estimation, the spatial equalizer, and we have the same model in this case. So we look at the uplink. In this case, we remove the quantizer, but you can see, we'll see later, we add it back again to show you the full picture of what happens if you combine everything. And the model is the same. S is what the users are sending. H models the channel. N is thermal noise. And Y is what we receive here at each uh, antenna. And our key task now here is of, of basement processing is imagine I give you an estimate of the channel and I give you the received vector. We have to uh, create an estimate of the transmit simple vector in this case. And it actually turns out that if you operate your massive MIMO systems at millimeter waves at these very high bandwidths, 
that even the simplest receivers can result in fairly complicated or fairly problematic hardware implementations. So maybe, maybe let me tell you first. So what you have to do at the receive side is basically you take your received vector and you have to take your received vector and map it to the U data streams that's coming from the users. And this is also known as spatial equalization. Basically, the idea is to get rid of the, the spatial interference that is caused between the multiple users that are communicating at the same time. And this task has to be essentially be done at the ADC sampling rate. So if you have an ADC that is running at one giga samples per second, you would have to do this um, uh, for every sample that you receive. For every sample, and remember you have like B of these or two B of these ADCs, so you have to do many of these, uh, um, process many of these vectors per second, billions of vectors per second. And clearly, if you go to these very high bandwidths, you probably want to do the simplest possible receiver. And in this case, we just focus on a linear uh, receiver. Basically, what the linear receiver does, it takes the received vector, multiplies it with a matrix, and that's the estimate. So this is the simplest possible receiver that you can think of. But it turns out that even the simplest possible receiver in a scenario which is millimeter by of massive MIMO, the power consumption would already be very high. So if you look at the 256 base station array uh, and you uh, want to support one gigahertz of bandwidth uh, and you implement an equalizer that just does this matrix vector multiply in hardware, uh, you already require about 27 square millimeters. That's actually huge. And the power consumption will be at least 21 watts, which is also quite a bit for only this matrix vector operation. This excludes all the power that is consumed in RF ADC and some of the downstream processing. So even this very trivial task is already consuming a huge amount of power. So now comes kind of like the key insight. And this is an insight that is coming from the hardware designers or the VLSI designers. If you have a multiplication, so think about this in a, in a matrix vector product, you have a lot of multiplications and then you have adders to do this in a product. It turns out that if you look at one multiplication and you wanna multiply in hardware an N bit with an N bit number, the area is roughly proportional to the product of the two bits. So a bit width, M and N, and the, the throughput or the, say the delay is dependent on the, the larger of the two. And the power consumption, this is very hand wavy, so don't quote me on that is roughly proportional to the area of the circuit as well. If the circuit is kind of utilized reasonably well, then the power consumption is roughly proportional to the area in this case. And now remember that before in everything I was talking before, we were reducing the resolution of the ADCs, but this is only half of the story. The ADCs would only be one of the two arguments of this multiplication. And clearly, if we would also reduce the other argument of the multiplication, we can further reduce area or shorten the critical path. And this is basically the idea is like, what, what happens if we reduce the precision of this equalization matrix that we are taking and multiplying to our received vector? And of course, a very trivial, this, this is the idea. And a, a trivial version of this would be you first compute your uh, MMSC equalization matrix. And this is the expression. It's not really important, but there's a way of calculating it. And then you just quantize the rows to say one bit values. You can do it a little bit more than just quantizing to plus minus one. What we actually do is we quantize it to plus and minus some value beta and we pick an optimal beta. And I will show later why this is important. So we kind of could think about this. We can we first compute it with full resolution, the matrix, and then we quantize. And now comes the key insight. Now, if you multiply your received vector to this quantized version of the matrix, uh, because it only has plus minus values, you only need adds and subtracts followed by a final multiplication that takes care of that uh, global scalar. So basically you can completely avoid a matrix vector product. It really turns out to just be a large adder array that adds and subtracts the numbers in the correct way. And the idea is very simple, I agree. So let's see how well that works. Um, and this again is like uh, SNR versus uh, bit array. This now is coded just because I wanted to show that we can also do coded systems and not just uncoded. Uh, this is 256 space station antennas. Um, 16 users, we look at the millimeter wave channel model in this case here, uh, which is created using uh, Quadriga, which is some uh, package that you can use to create channels. Uh, we use a convolutional code, this is OFDM, it uses power control. So think about this as a more, a more complicated, more realistic system. This is the performance you would get with infinite precision LMMSC. And this is what would happen if you just take the MMSC matrix and you quantize it the way I was explaining. And you can see there's a huge performance loss. So just quantizing and reducing the precision of your equalization matrix in a naive way does not work at all. 
So this is kind of like the key insight here. Um, and of course, there's a way of doing it, right? This was actually not the right way. This was the obvious way, but let's do it the right way. And it turns out that you have to really design these matrices. You cannot just create the matrix infinite resolution and quantize. You have to actually design it from scratch the proper way. And the way we do it is in a more principled way. So we now say that our equalization matrix, which was W before, let's call it V now, we impose a very specific structure on it. We say we want the matrix to contain of a diagonal matrix multiplied to a discrete matrix or a low resolution matrix. The diagonal matrix uh, is a really a diagonal matrix where each diagonal entry is a high resolution scaling factor. And the entries of the X matrix, which is the wide equalization matrix in this case, for example, is lower resolution could be just plus minus one plus minus J in this case. And if you have an equalization matrix of this form, then equalization can be implemented efficiently because you first, for each user, you do an inner product with one row of the X matrix multiplied with the received vector here and then followed by scaling. And the inner product here, so X permission times Y is what needs to be done, is what the high dimensional operation is. So this is what you have, what, what has B elements, but since it is only plus minus ones and J's, it's more or less just adders and subtractors. And then after you've computed this um, inner product, you just, scale it up using a higher resolution scaling factor. So basically the trick is let's design very specifically um, equalization matrix of this form of this two stage form of something low resolution and some scaling factor in this case. And now what we do is instead of blindly uh, trying to find this matrix, we can say, let's find, let's design this matrix that consists of beta, which is the vector beta contains the diagonal elements and X, which is the low resolution. Let's design it in a way that if we take a received vector, we multiply to this equalization matrix that it's as close as possible to the transmit symbol when we average over all symbols and the noise statistics. And you can see again, this minimization problem depends on the scaling factors and depends on the discrete elements in this case. Here. So this is what we would like to solve. Um, I can already tell you, you cannot solve this problem. Again, this is an MP hard problem because of the presence of, um, of this um, discrete matrix here. But what you can do first is you can kind of break it down into a simple problem. And uh, you can see this problem here in this case, um, you can do it on a per user basis. So you can, instead of writing one big problem, you can, you can solve or find the scaling factor and each row of that equalization matrix separately by solving this problem. Uh, unfortunately, this problem is still NP hard because of the discrete constraint. So yeah, this is also not what we can really do. But the interesting thing is that now I'm going to show a couple of tricks and these tricks are also similar tricks to what we have done in the C1PO algorithm. So if you were wondering, and the trick is basically this, the scaling factor is continuous or you can assume it's continuous. So you can first solve this problem by holding X fixed in beta and then you plug back in the optimal beta. And when, if you do that, you end up with a two stage approach of solving it. First, you can solve this expression here. And after you know your vector, you can find what the corresponding beta is. So the trick is here, you basically solve this problem in two steps. You figure out what is the optimal beta given X, then you plug that in here and then you simplify and then you end up with the problem that only depends on X. So now the only thing is we need to solve is this fractional program where we have still a discrete vector, but we only have to solve with this, but we don't have to worry about the scaling factor in this case. And the C1PO algorithm I was showing is using a very, very similar trick in this case. Again, unfortunately, the problem is NP hard. Uh, if you have 256 antennas, one bit, you cannot solve it. The complexity would just be way too high if you do a brute force search on this one here. But again, of course, we can do uh, something better. But let me first show you what the benefits would be. Like, imagine how, how much better would this even be compared to the simple approach I was showing. So this, again, we focus on a small system where we have only eight antennas. Um, because we can do an exhaustive search. This one is infinite resolution. This will be, you just take the MMS, uh, LMMSC matrix and you quantize. And this again will be if you design the matrix. And you can see again, you can get very close to what you will get with infinite resolution. So if you actually specifically define your matrix, which is this finite alphabet MMSC equalization, you can do significantly better. So the EVM is like half compared to the EVM you have here uh, for, the, for the naive approach in this case. And now comes the, the thing I skipped before for C1PO, but here I give you a little bit more detail. So how do you actually solve problems of this form? And, and the way we're doing it, so there's an interesting trick. Um, if you have, maybe I go back a second. If you have a, a fractional program like this, 
There is an old paper, I think it's also from like the 70s or 80s by, by a German guy called Dinkelbach, who showed that you can take this fractional program and you can uh, break that fraction into a difference of two terms. And the way this works is you suddenly end up with a difference of two terms. So you have one part here and the other part here. And this gamma here is a parameter that basically should correspond to your optimal solution. So imagine you, you know the objective value of your optimal solution. This is what you would multiply here. So basically, this is what we do. So we first use that trick from Dinkelbach to write it as a difference instead of a fraction. And then also what we do is um, we uh, relax the discrete alphabet to its convex um, envelope. So basically, if you have, say, imagine we have four points in the complex plane, we just put a box around, and now we allow all points within that box. And then also we, we use some additional trick here. I'm not going into too many details, but basically that that concave penalty here, make sure that the solution you're finding are actually in the corners of the box and the corners of the box are exactly your discrete solutions. And now if you have a problem like this, what you can do is you can solve it with a technique which is known as forward backward splitting and some people also know it as a projected gradient descent. So what you do is you first do a gradient step in the objective and then you do a projection onto this convex set. And then you do another gradient step and the projection. So this is a very simple gradient descent projection step algorithm in this case here. Um, so this one here, this part here on the right side is the gradient and the, the prox operator that you see here, make sure that you project that you stay within your convex set. And now you can do something interesting. So you have this like iterative procedure. What you can do is something which is known as deep unfolding. I'm not sure who has seen this before, but this is a fairly recent and emerging trick if you have iterative algorithms of, of some kind of the same form, what you can do is you can unroll this iterative procedure. So you say, let's do 10 iterations. Uh, we unroll it, and then it turns out to have a very similar structure as a neural network. Uh, you have a linear part, and then you have a nonlinear function here. And then you have another linear part, a nonlinear function. So you have a linear term, a nonlinear operation, linear term that looks like a deep neural network, linear, nonlinear, linear, nonlinear. And then what you can do is you can tune the algorithm parameters like the step size that you use for gradient descent and some other parameters you can tune using deep neural networks. So you don't have to figure out a very sophisticated step size selection rule or implement something complicated. You just simulate your system on a huge amount of reference channels and then you let the neural network find out what are the best parameters. And the good thing is this can be done offline, so it doesn't affect the complexity, and then the algorithm stays as easy as it was before, but it will give you significantly better performance if you do that. And in our case, compared to like hand setting these parameters, deep unfolding reduces the number of iterations by about a factor of two. That means for the same error rate performance, we can do about half the number of iterations. And then in the specific case, instead of 10 iterations, we can do five algorithm iterations and get uh, a good result. I think somebody asked a question. Maybe a question. Maybe I can answer that right now. Yeah. So the question from Chow Wai was: Does the ratio to difference relaxation approach have some technical conditions, such as certain terms must be small or certain terms must be large? So it, this this decomposition is exact if gamma is the value of the minimizer, and of course you do not know that. Otherwise, you can solve it. Uh, so this is kind of like a magic parameter that you, I mean, if you know it, you solve the problem, but imagine you know it. So you can write it like this. And now it's actually a very good observation uh, in that question. What we do is we say, you see the value shows up here. We then allow it to be a parameter and the deep neural network can then find it for us. So theoretically, if you know what the value of the minimizer is of the objective function, then this, these problems are equivalent. This one at the fractional program is equivalent. But in reality, we do not know the value, but we just let the neural network do it for us. So that's the trick, yeah. I can also send the, the original paper around uh, if, if, if uh, that would help. But I think this is actually a not very well-known trick, but for the people who deal with fractional programs is like a very standard technique. The proof is also not too hard. Basically what they show is that the solution to this problem and the solution to the fractional problem is the same if gamma is the value of the, basically of the objective function here, for the minimum. So you solve this problem, you know what the value is of this fraction and you plug in that value here, then it's the same. It's kind of strange, but it's also interesting. And we just then let the neural network decide what it should be. And that turns out to work extremely well. Yeah, I hope that helped. Um, is there another question or? Um, yeah, so another question actually came in, I think just regarding that. 
from Aranya. So FBS and projected gradient algorithms, ADMM, are usually super slow, even for small size problems. Is this optimization being done offline or in real time? No, this will be. So this is what's done in real time. So this you would solve in real time, but it turns out, I just mentioned it, five iterations of this method is enough. And the reason, and if, if you pick the step sizes, right? And there comes really this magic of the neural network. The neural network helps us to really find good step sizes for say only running five iterations. So you don't have to run hundreds of iterations. Five iterations are good enough. But I also have to say that we are not solving the problem. We are basically just going close to the solution. But it turns out that in reality, that's good enough. But yeah, if you want to actually find a minimizer, and you want to let it like converge, you would definitely need like 100 or 1,000 iterations easily. Yeah. And he also asked, would it help to speed up if you approximate the binary optimization as an MILP instead? Uh, I think solving a uh, mixed uh, integer linear program, I think it's very complicated because you have, in many cases, you have to do these branching and cuts. I don't think it will speed it up. I think this is probably the easiest you can do. Uh, honestly, I've never really tried how what the actual complexity of, of an MILP, but uh, I, my worry is that see, we have kind of experience with like convex and semi-definite relaxation solvers. They're very slow, so my worry is it would just make it slower. But I have no proof for that, so I'm just guessing. Yeah. Good question. Thank you. Okay, so um, yeah, so I basically showed you how to do an efficient algorithm, and, and now what I want to show you is that uh, compared to like the simple method I was showing that solving our method gives significant improvement. This is for one bit. If you do it for three bits, we're still better. If you do it for four bits, uh, sorry, if you do it for three bits here, uh, whether we do the complicated method or the simple method where you just compute the MMSE matrix and linear quantize uh, perform about the same. So this is this, these complicated methods help only if you want a really low resolution. But if you allow say three bit weights of your equalization matrix, then you can use conventional MMSC and then do this quantization scheme what I was mentioning in this case. But again, you see again, it's always the same thing. It's again, three bits. Three bits is just good enough in many of these applications. Let me now go uh, switch gears completely and show something a little bit off topic about maybe interesting to the people who do circuits. Um, typically, if you implement this matrix vector multiplication, what you would do is you would kind of like have the memory that stores your matrix and then you have some processing elements and you move the, uh, your elements from the memories to the processing elements and force them back. And that turns out to result in something which is a memory bottleneck, which uh, makes the power consumption higher by moving just the data around. Uh, but what you can do is if you suddenly have this low resolution equalization, you can store your, your weights next to the processing elements. Instead of having the weights stored somewhere else, you, you build processing elements that have the weights very local nearby. And then what you do is you let the data go through uh, your architecture. So instead of having the data and your memory items to go in and out, everything stays in place except the input data, like the received vector. And this reduces the power consumption and also results in extremely high um, throughput. Uh, in this case, what we did, we actually implemented some uh, uh, hardware design that does this efficiently, which is called PPAC or 2PAC. Uh, it's a parallel processor in associative content addressable memory. And it actually helps to reduce uh, energy consumption and also uh, the area is smaller. And I just wanted to give you a few results. I don't want to go too much details because I'm uh, getting close to the end of, of time already. Um, basically, what, what I want to show is that if you compare to a traditional implementation for e equalization, if you use finite alphabet equalization, FAME, you go from 10 to 3 bit, you can reduce the, the uh, area by about a factor of two, the power maybe by like a third. And then if you implement it on this PPAC, on this through memory processing architecture, you get an additional gain. In terms of power, uh, the reducing from 10 to 3 bit doesn't help as much, but then the hardware like this in or through memory processing architecture reduces the power consumption by. Uh, uh, almost a factor of three in this case. So just by, by exploiting the fact that now everything is low resolution, you can get significant reduction in uh, power consumption. And if you would go, this is for three bit, if you would go to one bit, you would actually get a 10X or almost a nine X, almost 10X reduction in terms of power consumption. Um, yeah, I, I'm a little bit low on time, but I wanted to show you that maybe the last thing is I was showing that we can reduce the precision of the ADCs. I was also showing we can reduce the precision in your equalizer, but now let's just quickly, very quickly at the end, put these things together. And it actually turns out that there's an interesting observation that the optimal resolution that you should use at your ADCs and in your equalizer, that should depend on how many users are transmitting at a time, what modulation schema they're using and what communication 
condition, uh, channel conditions you have. If you only have one user transmitting, you do not need four or three bits. One bit is enough. If you have many users communicating, you may want to have five or six or seven bits. And the same for the equalizer. So this is kind of like our idea. Like, what if you could build an architecture where you can dynamically adjust how many bits you use? And if you have easier conditions, you can actually use fewer bits and you can significantly reduce power consumption. And we have done this very recently. So this is brand new results. We've actually submitted that uh, last week. Um, we can model the power consumption of the ADCs based on real ADCs. And we can model the power of the equalizer based on a real implementation. And then we can look at these trade-offs. So this is, this is what I'm showing here is this is how much loss you get in performance by playing with the resolution. And this is the power consumption of the ADCs and uh, the equalizer. And what you can see here, if you have one user, you have this curve here. If you have one user, you can reduce the resolution. Uh, if you keep your resolution at high point, you have about 10 watts, but you can reduce it uh, to about one watt or even below one watt without losing any uh, SNR performance loss in this case. And you can see we have the same thing if you have a lot of users communicating at the same time here. There's again a trade-off here, but for, for this uh, mode where you have a lot of user transmit, there's not much you can do. But basically this means if you build a base station and there's at the moment, there's only one user that is transmitting, you don't have to operate at this extreme point here. You can actually significantly reduce the instantaneous power consumption. And you can also see this is two orders of magnitude difference between the powers of the different modes. And if you, you can also look at it in this way here, you can basically take a cut so this is a cut through this SNR loss where we show the number of UEs or number of users. And uh, the orange one is a, an architecture where we are not adapting the resolution, but we adapt how many users we're decoding. But you can see if you can actually adapt the resolution of the ADCs and also the resolution of the equalizer, you can get, for example, for one user, you get easily more than 10X lower power, even for two users more than 10X uh, and so forth. So basically having something that is resolution adaptive is the key to make something that has even lower power than uh, it's supposed to be. So this is something that is kind of like new, uh, but I think there's a lot of uh, research that can be done as like how much resolution is needed instantaneously, not just for like the configuration, but also for the channel conditions, um, for the modulation scheme. Also, for example, in, in millimeter wave, how near are the two are multiple users are, are two users nearby that may need more resolution as well, or if the power of two users is different say the power control is not that good, all these kind of things, you could adapt your receiver to that. So this is what we call resolution adaptive receiver and is another key goal to reduce the power consumption. And the interesting thing is this is not just some conceptual work, we've actually built a chip. Uh, this is a, uh, I cannot really give you more details because we're trying to submit a paper next week for a circuits conference. Um, this is a, an, all, an all digital beamformer. It has ADCs on it, equalizer, channel estimator, and so forth. And it has this idea in it that we can adapt the ADC resolution and uh, equalization resolution in this case here. So this is a chip uh, that is able to support 32 uh, receive antennas and is designed for millimeter wave operation in this case. So this is ADCs and all the digital processing. It doesn't include any RF chains as of yet, which will be probably the next version of the chip. Okay, so I think I'm already a little bit over, length, uh, over time, but let me just wrap up. Basically, what I'm saying, what I'm trying to, what I was trying to uh, make the point is that massive MIMO, uh, if you just blindly design your methods in a naive way, you will end up with excessive costs and power consumption. But massive MIMO allows you us to uh, reduce the resolution, uh, even though we have quantized and low resolution things. Uh, theoretical analysis is still possible. And also in almost all the results I've shown is that four to six bits is good enough for the uplink and downlink and for equalization three bits is in most cases good enough. And then also, as I said, this was very recent thing, a uh, very recent idea of us uh, that you, if you all start adapting the resolution of, of ADCs and the processing to the instantaneous system conditions, you can reduce the power even more by a factor of 10, depending on the moment. And then of course, everything I've shown so far can be implemented. So it's not just theoretical. So everything I've shown before, we have prototypes, we have measured it. So uh, yeah, these things actually work in, in reality. Uh, with this, I would like to conclude my talk. Uh, I would uh, very briefly mention uh, the key collaborators on this. Oscar Castaneda is my uh, most senior PhD student. He will, be, he will be done and hopefully at the end of the year. Um, Professor Giuseppe De Ruzzi was involved in a lot of the analysis. Tom Goldstein was involved in many of the optimization problems. Uh, and Sven Jakobson is at Ericsson now. Uh, there's a lot of information coming back from Ericsson, what they're interested in. So there's a lot of help from their side too. And of course, I would like to thank. Uh, this is a thank you to the sponsors of when I still was in the US. I still have students in, at Cornell, so I still need some of the money. 
But uh, more recently, uh, I'm at ETH, so I'm more happy if you just visit my website if you have any questions and you contact me. Uh, with this, uh, I would like to conclude and I'm very, very happy to take some final questions if there's time. Thank you very much for kind of a really cool and broad talk that's been covering a lot of areas. There is a question that popped up um, from Greg. Makes sense that the resolution depends on a number of users as the effective multi-user symbol constellation becomes dense, requiring more precision um, to keep distinct. I think maybe a comment there. Um, yeah, yeah so that, that, that's basically the, one of the motivation, but of course it also heavily depends on the channel itself. So, uh, for one user, it's, it's very obvious, but if you have difficult channel conditions for, as I said, for example, if you have two users that are nearby, you may still need higher resolution. So it kind of depends not just on the number of users, but also somehow together with the channel conditions. Of course, for Rayleigh fading, it doesn't really matter, but if you go to more millimeter wave -ish channels that are very structured, the, the, the channel and the modulation scheme together have to be taken into account for that. And some other conditions as well. Uh, as I said, power is another one. Yeah, but it's a good comment. Sounds good. Um, so just in light of time, I know a few of you are going to get to speak with Professor Studer this morning, um, this afternoon, his time. So I just want to thank you again. Thanks to the audience. This was our last um, seminar of the semester, but we hope to see you all in fall. And for the faculty out there, we'll be pinging you for other potential seminar speakers. Thanks, everyone. Have a nice afternoon. Okay, thank you. Thanks, everybody.